Hello, Children with Diabetes and Friends for Life community. This is Marissa, and I am going to introduce Jessica Kitchler. Jessica Kitchler is a pediatric psychologist who works with chronically medically ill kids and their families. She's also a certified diabetes educator. She provides individual, family, and group therapy for all ages of children and their families. She also engages in research, education, and training in the areas of adjustment and coping, adherence, and the psychosocial outcomes of chronic illness in children and families. Dr. Kitchler is a professor of pediatrics at the University of Cincinnati Medical School in the Division of Behavioral Medicine and Clinical Psychology at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center in Cincinnati, Ohio. Welcome, Jessica. Thank you. I appreciate that introduction and I will now share my screen so that everyone can see my presentation and I'll put myself over here and turn the video. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm doing a talk today on positive caregiving. And so um, as I was thinking about designing this presentation, I was really thinking about caregiving in this broader scope. It's not just a caregiver um, of a parent, but you might be a caregiver who's a spouse, you might be a caregiver that's a grandparent, or you might um, be a parent of a child with diabetes and you're sort of just looking at ways in which you're doing sort of the more nurturing, caregiving piece of it, or you can share this with um, a, a, a family, extended family member, an aunt, or someone, a family friend who sort of watches your child a lot. So I'm really thinking of caregiving in this very broad sense of sort of who's on your team, who helps care for the person with diabetes, whether it's a spouse, a best friend, a parent, a grandparent, um, and really thinking about how can you be the most positive and supportive um, parent and caregiver for the person with diabetes. So we'll talk a little bit about some common misconceptions concerning diabetes. We'll discuss helpful and appropriate interventions regarding diabetes care and thinking about it being sort of like a positive parent, a positive caregiver, and increase the comfort level of other um, potential caregivers to offer support and get involved, especially if um, the caregiver who's watching this or um, is, um, being shared this information is someone who's maybe outside of the, the media inner circle and maybe they're one step removed in ways for them to be helpful. So obviously um, we want to put the person first and the diabetes second. Um, and so we really want to make sure that, for example, um, we'll give it, I'll, I'll give a little scenarios of each of these things and then we'll talk about ways in which um, you can respond as a positive caregiver. So a way to put, um, a way that um, some caregivers don't put the person first is let's say um, your grandmother and you're out to lunch with your granddaughter and she has type one diabetes and she's 10 years old and you're super proud of her and you love her and you go to the table to sit down and the waitress comes and, and takes your order and you immediately as the grandmother start to say, oh, we need to know the carb counts um, of this and my daughter and my granddaughter has type one diabetes and I'm so proud of her and going on and on and on about the diabetes piece of it. Although that's lovely and wonderful that the grandmother wants to share with everyone how proud she is, um, what we need to be aware of is that we're putting the person first. Does the granddaughter want the waitress to know? Does the granddaughter feel like she's in control of her own messaging? if as a caregiver, you're announcing her story to everyone out there in person. So what we wanna think about when we're always thinking about doing person first and diabetes second is regarding the, um, the person as a person with diabetes rather than a diabetic. Now I know there's some people out there um, who have diabetes who call themselves diabetic. That is absolutely fine. That is their word, they own it. But for me, I'm not someone with diabetes. I refer to people with diabetes as a person with diabetes and not as a diabetic because I want to own, have myself, um, have them decide how much they're going to own and not own that. And so we want to um, make sure that we're not calling someone diabetic um, and that it's a person with diabetes. Um, it's okay to make diabetes management important, but it's not the only thing. When you're going out to lunch with your granddaughter, don't make that the only 
focus of the meal is how you're managing diabetes and counting the carbs. Yes, take care of what needs to be taken care of with the diabetes and then move on and have a nice pleasant conversation and talk about other things. Be discreet with reference to diabetes management. If you've um, talked ahead of time, if your granddaughter wants and maybe wants to look up the carb counts before you guys go to the restaurant so that it doesn't have to be something that's shared um, beyond the people that immediately need to know at the table, um, then you can do that as well. And it gets old to have others acknowledge diabetes and ask questions because if, let's say at this example of the waitress, then the waitress might turn to the 10 year old and say, oh, you know, my, my mom has type two diabetes and, and all of these things. And so now they're having to defend questions or answer questions from total strangers, which, which can just get tiring. Um, there's a time and a place to own your diabetes and not, not, I'm not saying be ashamed of it or be too private about it, but it also means that you need to find that balance of not, um, taking that power away from your granddaughter for when and how and how much she wants to talk about her diabetes to perfect strangers that she's never going to see again and aren't going to be a part of her life. Um, it might be okay, obviously, if it's with their friends or things or their teachers, obviously, they need to know these are important people that are in their lives day in and day out. But I'm talking more the, the random interactions um, in public. Another um, topic to focus on, not just person first, diabetes second, is managing the guilt. Um, so for example, I'll do a quick scenario. Um, so let's say mom has two kids and one has type one diabetes and one does not. And um, at dinner time, there's um, all this um, checking and correcting and managing blood sugars. And now it's time to clean the dishes and maybe the blood sugars are running a little bit funny. Um, and so mom says, don't worry, you don't have to do the dishes. I'll have your sister do the dishes. You can just sit here because your, your numbers are a little bit high. And then the sister's like, wait a second, what about me? Why do I have to always do the dishes every time after the meal? Um, and then she starts to feel resentful. And the mom's like, well, he's got to deal with diabetes. So I feel, and in her mind, she's thinking, I feel guilty about that. So how do I make him deal with his diabetes and do his normal chores? And so that can be an example of how you're managing guilt over your child might have more um, tasks to do at meal times or at exercise times. And then, and then how do you balance that with still having everyday expectations for them as a, as, um, a child learning how to, you know, take care of chores and take care of dishes and do those sorts of things. So um, a lot of times what we say is to try as much as you can. Now, obviously if the blood sugars were so low, they were, you know, a 40 and the child can't even stand up or make sense. Obviously you're not going to have them stand up and do the dishes right then, but within reason they can still do dishes or you can have everybody wait on the dishes or you can have your other child do a portion of the dishes and then save the dishes for um, your child with diabetes as soon as their numbers sort of level out um, and that we don't want to have diabetes be some reason why they don't have to do other typical childhood expectations because we really do want them to learn these same skills um, and we don't want them to get out of them. So we want to just make sure that you know that you can um, do normal childhood expectations and have consequences and you know, whenever there's an expectation from a diabetes point of view, we really want you to think that it is okay, even though you feel extremely guilty that your child might, or you may feel guilty that your child has diabetes, you can still give them rewards and consequences for doing their diabetes management for their behaviors, such as checking a blood sugar or doing something that's expected of them. But you're never punishing or giving a consequence for a diabetes outcome, like was the blood sugar high, was it low? It's never the result that gets punished. But if if they were supposed to check before um, soccer practice and they didn't check before soccer practice, and then they were they went out to practice and they weren't safe, well, consequence might be, well, now I have to come to soccer practice to make sure it happened, or you don't get to go to soccer practice tomorrow because I need you to learn that you have to do this before you go. And even though that might make you feel guilty, this is just as you would teach any of your children, um, whatever behavior needs to be managed for their life, this is part of their life and part of what needs to be managed. 
You want to have the same age appropriate expectations for completing other non diabetes tasks like doing chores, doing their dishes, um, and really watching and making sure you're not being too permissive because you feel guilty that they have diabetes. So, oh, I feel guilty that they have to manage these highs and lows. So, you know, I'm not going to make them clean up or do whatever because I just feel so bad that that they've got to deal with this. And that is um, really can hurt you in the long run if that child gets the message that they're somehow extra special because of diabetes and then they don't have to do these things. They're not suddenly five, 10 years from now going to now know how to take care of chores and to cleaning up after themselves. And they get a little bit of a prince or princess complex where they think that the world revolves around them. And so you really want to be careful that this is diabetes is a chronic condition. They're going to have to manage all their regular life with diabetes. So the sooner we're folding diabetes and their age appropriate normal expectations into their world, the better you're preparing them for later in life when they're going to continue to have to do this. Now, again, within reason, there's a time if they're so low that they need to sit on the couch and eat gummy bears, that's what they do. But then once that's over, now it's back to business as usual, or they have to finish cleaning their room, or they have to do whatever, and that they get the message that life needs to be integrated with diabetes, not in, um, and that diabetes doesn't become almost an excuse for not doing things. Because tr children really want to be treated like everyone else. Even though you think you might be doing them a favor by not having them do that chore, it really sends a message, I'm different, I'm not like everyone else, and we don't want them to internalize that. We want them to say, hey, you're just like everyone else, you just have to deal with this on top of it, and I know you can, and I know you can make both work. Um, so we really wanna be careful of caregiver guilt, or um, if you're a grandparent or some other um, caregiver that you're not walking on eggshells, that they are still everyday regular kids and need to learn these everyday regular um, goals. Um, a couple of myths, a lot of you probably know a lot of the myths, especially um, around um, being recently diagnosed. Let's say you go to school and there's a new administrative assistant working the front desk and she knows your, your child's coming up front to check their blood sugars because of the diabetes and she starts talking about her mom who has type one, who has type two diabetes and doesn't know the difference between the two. Um, and so you're always constantly having to deal with that or you're starting a new school and the kids hear that, you, that your, your child has diabetes and they think it's contagious. All of those typical myths that happen in terms of diabetes not caused by eating too much sugar, your person cannot catch it. And I know everyone in this in this virtual room knows all of these myths, but a lot of times as a caregiver, you're, you're having to help your child advocate for themselves and helping um, educate people that there's nothing that they could do to prevent type one, that there's a difference between type one and type two. More insulin is not a bad thing. It's just whatever your body needs to care for itself and take care of itself. Um, that testing too often or testing a lot doesn't mean that you have quote unquote bad or brittle diabetes. Um, and a person with diabetes can do anything that someone with diabetes can do, that someone without diabetes can do, as long as it's managed appropriately. And then, and really, 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 I just want to drive this one home. Don't share stories about other adults with diabetes who've had chronic complications. Um, if scare tactics work, I would say yes, use them, but they don't work. So saying, oh, if this happens, you you know, Grand, Grand Aunt Susie had her foot cut off or whatever it is, those stories are just create more anxiety. And when we have more anxiety, we're more likely to avoid the thing that brings us anxiety. And so if kids start to learn anxiety is paired with diabetes, the paradoxical or the opposite effect is they're gonna go, okay, that brings me anxiety. I want to avoid everything that has that brings me anxiety. So I'm going to avoid diabetes because I, if I avoid diabetes, then that takes away my anxiety. So actually increasing their anxiety about long-term complications that are really so far down the road and not really in their immediate control serves to just raise anxiety without them really knowing a way for them to, to change that outcome and, and is more likely to make them avoid um, diabetes. And so you are actually making it worse by using um, 
scare tactics. And, and I have to tell this to my, my medical colleagues as well, um, that this is not um, what's helpful in the long run and just raises everyone's anxiety. Another little um, topic or tidbit that I want to sort of bring up is um, numbers are just data. It really is, whether it's an A1C number, whether it's a time and range number, whether it's a blood sugar level number, it really is data and that we really want to think about it in that way and that we're analyzing it as such. For example, if a, a dad and a son and the son has type one um, and his blood sugars are 300 and the dad says, your blood sugars are 300, you're not going outside. Um, because you must have done something to make yourself a 300. You must have um, taken food without permission or whatever it is. So what we want to be very, very careful of is when you see that 300, how you handle that 300 and how you're modeling that 300 um, for your child and how you're modeling for them to interpret it. Because if you're interpreting it as bad or wrong or too high, um, they will start to say, I failed. When they see a 300, they start to, let's say they're 25, they'll see a 300 and say, I'm bad. And so we really want to separate out the number from the person. The number is the number. The number might be higher than we want it to be. Um, we might need to problem solve around it and we might need to think about it, but we want to be careful that we don't fuse the number with the person and give them emotional and judgmental comments because a number is high. Um, so you want to be very, very careful that you're not punishing for a high blood sugar and you're really giving as much as you can a neutral response. Okay, you're 300. Let's think about this. What, what went into that 300? Um, because as I've um, seen in other places, you know, there's 42 factors that goes into one blood sugar. Many of those factors are not in our control. Um, and it's not that we want to then absolve our kids from any responsibility and say, okay, Number is random, you didn't, you, you know, there's no, nothing you could have done, but finding that middle ground of we have the number, we can't, by shaming and blaming people right now, we can't go and undo that number. All we can do is take that number, learn from it, react to it, take care of it now and say, okay, we are where we are. What are we going to do at this point? How are we going to move forward? How are we going to fix this and get this in under control so that you can go out? Um, and maybe it's the year 300 and it's not so much a punishment. You can't go out, but Hey, it's not safe for you to go out until we get you in a, in a, a tighter range. So let's go ahead and dose and correct. And then we can go out in a little bit as soon as your numbers go in the right direction or whatever it is. Um, because the kids are going to pick up on your stress and model how you handle the blood sugar levels. And this is gonna be throughout their lifetime. So you're really setting this early fundamental stage for what the numbers mean to you. And so then they mimic that and they model and they learn their little sponges. And if they see you reacting to that way, then they'll learn to react that way. And then they'll turn that anger inwards towards themselves and are much more likely to get burnout and distress and depression later in life because Later when they see those numbers, they're gonna turn it inward. So we really wanna work as a team to figure out what needs to happen. Okay, we're 300, let's get in this. Let's roll up our sleeves together. Let's figure out what happened and what we're gonna do from now. It's not that they're bad or did something wrong just because they have a low or high blood sugar. And um, you'll hear me very um, um, deliberately saying you're checking blood sugars. We're dropping the term for many years now of testing because it's not a test. It's not a test to see if your child passed or failed. It's a check. It's open our eyes. Let's look at the CGM. Let's look at the blood sugar check. Let's see where you are so that now we can deal with it. I like to use the metaphor as diabetes is like driving down the highway with your eyes closed and you're trying to stay between the two white lines. And the only time you get to open your eyes and see where you are on the highway, are you too onto the high, are you too high, are you too low, or are you right in the middle? The only time you get to look is when you're looking at that CGM or you're checking a, a, a blood sugar. And, um, and that is the time in which we get to open our eyes and do some correcting. Let's, let's do it. If you were driving down the road with your eyes closed and I said, okay, you get to open your eyes and we saw that you were all the way off the road over here. If I spent all my time being like, how'd you get over on that side of the road? How, why happened? What did that do? Da, da, da. Instead of I'm saying like, let's get you back on the road. 
let's let's spend our time getting you back here let's get you back here and we'll deal with what what got us there in the first place and let's spend more of our time correcting and figuring it out and getting you back in the middle of the road and go into the mode of okay what are we doing next not what happened back there i don't i don't really want to know what happened back there at that moment we might talk about it later if there's patterns or whatever but in that moment when you're driving on the shoulder of the road our main goal is get you back in the middle of the road and that's what we need to focus in on as we go into that sort of neutral mode of like okay let's deal with it we're team let's let's deal with what we have and we're going to move forward so i really want you to think about how you're responding to data and how you're responding to the numbers because your kids are watching and and they're they're watching how you respond to it and learning um, and internalizing that. Um, another thing, um, as a caregiver, um, or you know, whether you're a family friend or um, a grandparent, or if you're interacting with um, friends of, of other kids with diabetes, is to avoid unsolicited advice. So, you know, maybe for your child, the a certain pump and a certain CGM is the best, right? And that has just worked for you guys and you guys are sleeping through the night now and this is excellent. But you know another family, maybe at Friends for Life or elsewhere, and they, or you're on a Facebook group or something like that, and they're, they're still using syringes and they're, or they're still using injection pens. And you just need to be very careful if you're like, it's great to say, hey, this technology worked for us, but to be very careful of being like, you should do this, you should do that, because everyone's different. Some people embrace the technology, other people don't embrace the technology, and there's no one right way to fully manage your diabetes. And so we just want to really, really want to be aware of unsolicited advice. Um, and or if you're a parent or a caregiver of maybe a child who's 15 or 16, and you're talking to a parent of an eight-year-old, be extra careful that you are not giving unsolicited advice that says that there's one way, well, at 12, my child was doing X, Y, and Z, or at 14, they were doing this. To so be very careful of being aware that every child has a different maturity trajectory, every child um, has a different age at which they're ready to do things. And so um, obviously give your help and your support and you can give your child as an example, but be extra careful that you're not saying as a, you know, as a grandparent or something that says, well, shouldn't she, she, shouldn't she, she be doing this by the time she's 12 years old, she's in middle school now. Age is not a determinant of what um, kids with diabetes should or shouldn't be doing. And we have to have very individual goals for each of the kids. Um, there's several factors that contribute to readiness, whether it's readiness for technology, readiness to take on more independent skills. Um, and it also includes like how recently they were diagnosed. Um, if they actually have been diagnosed a really long time, you might think, oh, well, they should, should be able to do everything. But sometimes diabetes burnout can kick in when you've had it for so long. And so maybe they're taking a step back and the parents are stepping in to sort of relieve some of that burnout. Or maybe they were recently diagnosed and all this is so new that they really feel the most comfortable with their parents taking um, a lot of the role. And every child develops at a different rate. There's no magic age when they need to be in charge um, of their own care. We really do think about though, about what they need to do in order to be safe. So um, if they want to be spending the night independently at a friend's house, what are the tasks that they need to do to keep safe? Or what are the tasks that we need to have the parents who they're staying with feel comfortable with? So um, there's no magic age, but there are certain things that we need to sort of have in place before they can have certain independence. Um, and the family will determine the best therapy. There's so many different factors. Um, for different technology use, such as insurance coverage, co-pays, activities, convenience, whether that child is okay with the visibility of having diabetes, maybe they don't want the devices hanging off of their bodies, all that sort of thing, their adherence to it, maybe they've tried the pump and it's not been great, and so this is a way, and they have better adherence when they're doing injections, and, and that's okay. So just be very careful of unsolicited advice um, when someone has not asked for your uh, opinion on it. 
Um, I want to talk a little bit about nagging and reminding. This is a really, really, really important one for parents and caregivers and spouses and and um, and all kinds of different um, caregivers out there. So whether your caregiver, whether you're a helper who's um, a partner or a spouse, uh, boyfriend, girlfriend, wife, husband, grandparent, we really want to be careful that you don't fall into the trap as the helper um, of, be, of miscarried helping. And so just to go through this um, slide a little bit, um, I went through this on a different talk earlier today, but I'm not sure everybody is listening to all the talks, so I just want to hit this one again. Um, so this is where the helper really wants to be helpful and supportive. Um, all of us helpers, myself included, we want to be helpful. And we have to be careful because as a helper, we can't increase, uh, we want to increase efforts, but we don't want to add demands, doubts, and criticisms, which can then make the person with diabetes feel shamed and blamed, discouraged and unmotivated, angry towards the helper, and angry towards the, the, um, themselves. Because 99.9% .9 of the persons with diabetes, they want to take care of their diabetes. They want to be healthy. They want this to be working. It's just a really tough um, management. And so what we want to be careful of is that maybe the husband didn't find some new diabetes technology and it's like, you should be using this, or we should be doing the looping, or we should be doing this, or should be doing that, or doubting or criticizing, well, if you were just, if you weren't doing injections and we were doing um, a pump, then we wouldn't have this problem. Because then that would make the person with diabetes feel shamed and blamed, discouraged and unmotivated. And then step four, it actually makes the person with diabetes less likely to take care of their diabetes. It makes them want to reject it and sort of push it away in order to keep independent from those really uh, uncomfortable feelings. So it sometimes has the opposite effect of the helper wants to help so much that they can actually make it worse by making the person with diabetes um, feel so shamed and blamed that they push the whole thing away. Um, which then makes the helper want to help even more. And then we're kind of off to the races. And so you can see here, what I like about this is this is a cycle and that no one person is to blame because the person with diabetes has responsibility for even if they feel shamed and blamed um, for ha um, with their diabetes interactions, they still need to take care of their diabetes and find ways to push through those negative emotions and not um, use avoidance coping where they're pushing diabetes totally away. But then there's also ways that the helpers need to find ways to be helpful that doesn't add de demands, doubts, and criticism. So how do we react to numbers in a neutral way? How do we say, how can I be on your team? How can I help you advocate? How can I be supportive to you in a way that doesn't make um, the patient or the person with diabetes feel more shamed and blamed? It's just a number. How can we problem solve? How can we go from here? How can we take that, that 300 and put you back? Um, to where it, it feels very comfortable for you. And there's a lot of ways that you can do this um, as a caregiver, whether you're a spouse or a grandparent, um, there's a lot, there's some communication do's. And so on this side are all the do's, the don'ts are over here and these are the opposite ones. So instead of yelling, name calling or swearing, keeping a calm voice, instead of interrupting, wait until the other person's taken a turn. Instead of lecturing, take turns about the problems. Instead of bringing up past failures, stay in the here and now. Instead of lying about your feelings and saying, fine, I'm fine, there's nothing wrong, I'm not mad about anything, um, you'd be honest about your feelings. Instead of refusing to speak and being like, nope, I've got nothing to say, um, talk about your thoughts and feelings. Instead of blaming, you did this, you did that, if only you did this, using I statements, I'm feeling this or I'm feeling that. Not listening, meaning as soon as um, the person with diabetes is trying to explain something to you, you tune them out. It uh, makes them feel disrespected, listening to what's being said and try to restate it. I heard you say this so that you make sure you understand. So as a, as a caregiver, as a helper, um, when you're doing number two, we really want you to think about using your positive communications and really watching out for the don'ts um, because that's not helpful. Um, and is shame inducing. Um, so when it comes to sort of reminding versus nagging, so let's say Johnny and his mom are at the table and mom's not 
sure whether he checked his um, blood sugars before he sat down and she said, did you even bother to check or um, in a way that's sort of more of a nagging, I bet you didn't even check or you're 300, there's no way you did anything before this. And so we really wanna be careful that that's different. It's the tone of voice, it's the, the phrasing that you use versus reminding, hey, just checking in, did a check happen? Um, let me see your number. A lot of times not even asking the question of, so that they're not boxed into a corner. So I'll even encourage um, caregivers, whether you're a spouse, a parent, whomever, if you want to know whether something happened, to, to not ask as much a direct question um, that says, did you or did you not? Because then the child or the other person with diabetes is trapped. They're either going to tell you, no, I didn't do something and disappoint you that way, or they're going to lie to you and say they did because they want to please you. And so they're stuck kind of between a rock and a hard place. So a lot of times um, what I'll tell caregivers is just say, what was your number? Or did you get a chance to? Or um, and just asking, assuming they did it, say, you know, and make the question, what was it? Oh, I just want to check what it is before we get started. Um, what was it? Don't assume they didn't do it, assume they did do it, and then go from there. Um, and really reminding in as neutral of a way as possible. Um, maybe you could even ask your, your person with diabetes, whether it's a child or a spouse, how can I remind you? Well, how would you like to know? Sometimes people just want a text message. Some people um, say, don't remind me until my CGM has been going off for a half an hour or 10 minutes, or I don't notice it. And so getting permission of, hey, how can, I'm going to remind, I want to keep this on the forefront. What's the best way for me to do it? And then it's when it's negotiated, then when you do exactly what they've asked you to do, then they're much less likely to be defensive because they know they've asked you to help remind them in that way. Um, and being aware of your own, a lot of times nagging comes from your own anxiety or your own fear or your own frustration and your own emotions. So you're like, you're nagging because you're thinking, oh, of course he didn't do it. He never checks. I'm so tired of being the one that's the only one that remembers. And then you take that frustration and then you take it and you dump it into that, that interaction and say, did you even bother checking? Um, and then you've taken all of your emotions and you've just shifted them to the child, which is not actually going to solve anything because then that makes that child feel shamed and blamed and then discouraged. And, and all of it's done is just taking your emotions, whether it's your anxiety emotions, your frustration, and dumped it on somebody else without actually much positive outcome and it doesn't actually do anything. I mean, if it worked and, and I said dumping your anxiety on your child makes them more likely to do it, then great, I'd say do it, but it doesn't. Um, it actually just dumps your anxiety out and then it makes the child more likely or the person with diabetes more likely to reject your help and, and makes their diabetes even worse. So just be very aware of your tone of voice to minimize the shame and blame trying to create a, a, a setting where worries and issues can be easily discussed, where you're saying, you know, I'm really worried that you're coming to dinner every day without a blood sugar check done. What can I do to help remind you? How can we set this up so that we remember to do it together? Are there certain days I can help you remind you or how? And so that you're really stating it more of a, I'm worried about blah, blah, blah. And how do we fix it going forward instead of I'm worried. So I'm going to say, did you, did you check? Did you check? Did you check? And then you've asked three or four times because you're so anxious about it that you're just taking your emotions and putting it on the child without saying, Hey, I can talk about my emotions. I'm, fr I'm really feeling frustrated that this isn't happening. How can we work this out together? Um, and, and it's really important to talk about the emotions, but not take your emotions and, and place them on the child. Because then the child can speak to the caregiver in a way that communicates their need and says, well, I need this, or we're a team. And it really promotes this term called interdependence. And that's where you guys are working together as a team everybody's got a role, everyone's got a job, and then you don't feel as frustrated as the caregiver of you're just owning a job without actually talking to the person with diabetes and saying, well, what kind of job do you actually want me to have or what role can I play? 
because we know scare tactics don't work. We know um, threats don't work. We know all of those pieces of saying this is going to happen to you down the road or whatever. That just, again, raises anxiety, creates um, a paradoxical impact of they're less likely to do it later. So how do we set up ourselves as caregivers? We care for our persons with diabetes so much. How can we be the most helpful to them? And these are all ways that we can be helpful in terms of reminding and supporting and not nagging and shaming and blaming. A last piece um, that we have is, you know, thinking about special events. Maybe it's a graduation, maybe it's a birthday party, maybe it's something else. Um, so things that caregivers can do um, when you um, maybe you're hosting your grandparent and you're hosting um, Christmas dinner or Thanksgiving or something, be proactive, provide carbohydrate information to the family. Um, if it's your uh, you know, family recipe passed down for generations, figure it out, do it before the celebration and figure out the carb counts before. Um, be willing and to learn how to check blood sugars if you are a grandparent or if you're a spouse or a friend in the family. It would be so helpful if you could learn some, some basic tasks to help um, the person with diabetes manage it. Be willing to learn how to manage the lows, um, to really have a calm, reassuring state of mind when there's a low instead of um, being um, taking your anxiety and showing it on the outside because the child um, with diabetes will pick up that that's a really fearful reaction. So how to manage it in a very neutral and matter of fact way. Discuss activities with the family. If, if you're a caregiver and you're going to take um, a child with diabetes overnight, what activities do you plan to do? Be thoughtful in terms of, okay, I want to take them to the trampoline park. How can we manage that? Um, have your own fast-acting carbohydrates available if you're going to be um, with someone with diabetes and you're a, a friend of the family or a grandparent. Carry fast-acting carbs. Carry a roll of um, Smarties in your in your purse or in your car or whatever, and so that you always have some fast-acting carbs and you're ready to go to. And then having your current you know contact information, you're always in contact if you're a friend of the family and um, someone's spending the night at your house really being in regular contact with the family and, and really working as a team to, to do these special events. And then I'll end with some strength-based um, messages. We really um, want um, the interactions between caregivers and, and the persons with diabetes to be positive, whether you're a spouse or a partner or whatever. We really want it to be a strength-based model. Identify the person with diabetes' greatest assets help them with their diabetes management. If you're wanting to problem solve goals, make them smart goals. Okay, let's do this. Be very specific about what your job is, um, what you can do. Um, pay attention to, if you're a caregiver of a child with diabetes, you might be really worried about the future of, oh, there's gonna be complications or how are they gonna ever go to college or how are they ever gonna be independent? And the child with diabetes often has very present concerns, like I don't want to have a low blood sugar in the middle of my class and embarrass myself. And so both are valid, and we have to sort of find that balance between the both. So it might be that a child's running themselves a little higher at school because they really want to avoid the lows, and then the grandparent's saying to them, but you're going to have complications later. So how do we find that sweet spot between okay, maybe we run ourselves a tiny bit higher at school because there aren't as many sort of immediate caregivers right there. But at the same time, we're balancing that with not running ourselves so high that we're causing more um, damage to our body and those kinds of things. Um, and to remember that long-term diabetes management can cause burnout. Um, so encouragement and praise really helps that child stay motivated. This isn't just for children, this is for any age. So the more you can encourage and praise the person that you care for with diabetes, it helps them stay motivated and optimistic. Um, diabetes is relentless and they know it. And if you then add more um, negativity and shame and blame and, and negative emotions on top of that and nagging, you're not inspiring motivation and optimism to keep going and keep moving and to keep keeping um, confident about their ability. And to always be a reassuring presence during diabetes events, watching, waiting, step in when help is needed. 
Um, that is your role as a caregiver, is you are a reassuring presence. You are there, you're there to step in, but you're gonna wait and help when you're sort of needed. I wanna end with a little bit of um, some books um, that I wanna recommend. I've, you might've seen these in other um, talks, but I just wanna highlight that these are really great um, books around raising teens. Um, Cheating Destiny is a really nice one for adults with diabetes because he, um, James Hirsch, has type one and he's an adult. And he's also a parent of a child with diabetes. So he sort of brings all those perspectives to the table. All right. All right, thank you so much, Jessica. I really, this is such a good topic and I think it's something that, um, you know, we all struggle with is, is using um, I statements and, and really talking to people and helping be supportive um, without judgment. It's really a difficult thing to do. So I just had a few um, questions that I wanted to ask. Some of them are a little easier and some of them are a little more challenging. So mm -hmm. uh, we'll see, but the, the first one is, you know, if you're a caregiver, let's say you're like a grandparent or a neighbor, aunt, uncle, something like that, and you want to help take the child for a night to give the primary caregivers a break, how can you make the family feel comfortable with you taking them? Mm -hmm. I think number one is assuring the family that you will communicate communicate and communicate whenever there's any sort of question that your bar will actually be fairly low um, for reaching out. And that's because I think our natural inclination is like, oh, I'm going to take this and I won't bother you and I won't ask you questions. And truly what the parent wants to hear is I'm going to take them. And if there's anything that's happening out of the norm, you are going to ask. They want that communication, even though it feels like it might be bugging them. It's not because they're actually going to rest assured that if you're not reaching out, then that means their kid's doing really well at their house. And that if there's any sort of question, they would rather hear about it and help you problem solve it and be rest assured that good things are happening versus if you take them for the night and then the next morning they hear when they pick them up that they had a 40 and you managed it all by yourself, that's going to make them not so worried and not trust that you're going to reach out. So it's actually about communicating, communicating and being willing to communicate and, and have a fairly low bar for that um, so that the parents feel less anxious. It's not about bothering them. It's about feeling less anxious while they're there. Great. And then let's say, what if you are a, um, a caregiver that is looking to help with an older teenager, for example, like the parents are going to go out of town for a weekend and you're supposed to be looking after them and they have told you that, don't worry, I've got this, I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. How do you handle um, navigating those conversations? So what I would what I would typically do, because it's out of the norm, um, is I would typically go to the teen and say like, hey we're a team this weekend. I want us to have a really good weekend. So it might be a little bit different than what you do at home. I think we run into this a lot at diabetes camp too. So, you know, I go to diabetes camp a lot and, uh, and what we'll find there is the kids are like, well, I do this at home. Well, I do this at home. And so we have that overt conversation at the beginning that you're coming here is not just to replicate home. It's for us to figure out what's going to work in our house for this weekend. And it may be that um, we ask the teenager, I, I trust that you've got this, but I need you to bear with me that I need to, to know a little bit more. And this may be, you know, your parents might be comfortable with this, but let's put some of the game plan and some of the things out front that may be different and different's not bad. I'm not here to just say that it has to be just like your parents. It has to be what we're negotiating at our house and just as kids learn like at school there's certain rules or expectations at home there's certain rules or expectations or if you go between a mom and a dad's house there's different rules and kids can learn to adapt and so if you own that and say I'm not here to just have you have the same experience that you have at home but figure out what experience and what communication and what we're going to work on here so that we can be successful here so that you can keep coming back here because it is different and difference okay and we can negotiate that up front. Great tips. And then mm -hmm. 
What about for interacting with the kids directly? Let's say it's like a, a tween or a young teen or even younger. How do you recommend the, the interactions go? Like how do you ask them about their blood sugars and how they're feeling? Or maybe they're acting a little bit uh, abnormal and you want them to check their blood sugar without mm-hmm. having to say, will you check your blood sugar? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, I think, I think there's two levels of answers to what you're saying. So I think if it's every day, you just want to check in and see how they're feeling. And there's not sort of that immediate concern of a high or a low. I think if you're just wanting to uh, open up the conversation, I would take it away from any sort of a diabetes management. And so what I'll do is I'll often recommend for families, and this could even be for, um, you know, at any age, of do what I call it talking log. It's an old phrase because we don't really use log books anymore. Um, but you really protect about 10 minutes of a day. Maybe it's right before your child goes to sleep or whatever. And it's separate from all the other diabetes conversations, but it's really a time to say, let's talk about the day. Let's talk about what went well. Let's talk about what didn't go well at this really global level, not what was this 121 and this 134 and, you know, not getting into all the weeds, but really protecting that 10 minutes of just talking about diabetes and what, what can I do differently? What went well on your end? What, you know, how did you receive that? And so it's really a two way street. And then you're not spending a lot of other time throughout the day asking about diabetes over and over and over again, because all the kids are sort of duck and weaving all the diabetes questions all the time. And so if you really try to pocket it into one communication time a day, you're going to get a lot because their defenses are going to be down a little because it's not immediately tied to a certain number or a certain interaction over dinner when they didn't check when they came to the table or whatever. Don't have that conversation then. Have it separate and, and really open up. You know, if you do it nightly, it's awesome. If you can even do it a couple of times a a week or even a Sunday night, let's process the week and talk about it for the next week. That's really going to really set that routine that the child's going to be able to talk about it. So I think talk and log or pretending, protecting that little bit of talk time about it is so important. The second piece of you are worried that there's a low or a high happening and you're like, oh, how do I, how do I ask them in a way? Um, And And what I often use, I'll often use humor or I'll often sort of use the situation to be like, I know that, you know, I know this is a frustration, Mm -hmm. bear with me. I just want to, I just want to make sure, can we just rule this out so that then we can get past it? And so I'll often say things that isn't just asking the question, but kind of taking that, like, I recognize how this interaction is going and taking almost that third person step of like, I know this is this has a chance to make it, you know, you're frustrated at me right now, but I really just need to make, take diabetes off the table so then we can deal with whatever else is happening. And so that's how I tend to think about it. Um, I'm just like, bear with me, we got to do this and then we can move on. Great. Um, I put in a hard question so Uh-oh. for this, but it's, you know, it's something I imagine will happen, especially when kids are, are high and grumpy or if they're just grumpy because they're grumpy. But, mm-hmm. you know, let's say you're your grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, and you have them for the night and they, you're asking the kid, you know, Hey, how's your, how are things going? Are you feeling all right? How's your blood sugar? And the response is stop mm-hmm. nagging. You're not my mom right? Or mm. something like that. Because I'm, I'm imagining that will probably happen at some yeah. point, depending on the age of the kid. And I'm just wondering um, how you'd recommend navigating that. Yeah. Um, I would say um, very simply um, to say, uh, to respond by saying, I may not be your mom or dad, but I'm someone who cares a lot about you. And I love you. And, and just take it back to the emotion of I care and I love you and I'm asking this question and I'm, and you can even apologize. I'm sorry if this question comes across as me checking up on you and I'm really not trying to check up on you. I'm really trying to express that I love you and I care about you and I just want to hear how you're doing and I want to make sure you're doing okay while you're in my house. And just take it to that next level of rather than just being reactive to whatever they said process a little bit about what's happening and and that at the end of the day you love them and you want to be positive with them and you can use fun 
and joking and all the love and you just be like, in some ways, being a caregiver without a parent is in, in some ways this amazing gift because you don't have to be the parent. You don't have to be the one who's constantly doing this. You get to have fun and do the warmth and the loving things. You do need to keep your structure and say, hey, we got to do this part, you know, while you're here, we got to do this, this piece because I can't, I want you to keep coming and you can't keep coming if you and I can't keep you safe here. And so you've like joined together and said, come on, work with me here so that we can have this fun thing happen and we can keep having this together um, because I care so much about you. Perfect. Love it. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the last question is, you know, how can caregivers help support the parents or whoever the primary caregivers are? Yeah, um, I really think what, well, a couple of the things um, to reiterate is the unsolicited advice. If you've learned something about, you know, diabetes or, you know, you've read something where they, where they said there's this cure, if you take this <laughs> one herb or one this or one that, um, be very careful about um, giving it to them in a way that feels like you have an answer that they've never known about. Be like, whoa, I learned something. Would you like to hear it? Mm -hmm. Or send it in an email that's a very non-intrusive way. Um, because although you want to help, you have to make sure the person receiving the information wants that help. And if you come across um, as having this answer that they've never thought of, 99% of the time they've heard it, they've seen it, um, yeah. they know about it. And so just be very aware of unsolicited advice um, and making sure you get permission to give some advice um, because your job as the caregiver is, is really support, love, positive, whatever they need, you're going to give it to them. And it's not your job to figure out what they need what they need, but to tell, have them tell you what you need to give them. Love it. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Jessica. This was a really, really great talk. Um, I hope everybody gets to tune in and thank you for listening.